Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de la Bera, translated by Robert Southey. Book Four, Chapter Forty Two. How King Lisuarte and Queen Brisena and the Princess Leonoreta came to the firm island, and how those knights and ladies went out to receive them. King Lisuarte, when all things were ready for his departure, set forth with Queen Brisena and the Princess Leonoreta and his high steward, King Arban of North Wales, and King Kildadan, and Don Galvanus, with Marasima his wife, who were now come from Mongaza, and other knights. But King Gasquilan had returned to his own country. They travelled on till they came within four leagues of the firm island, where they rested one night. When Amadis heard that they were so near, it was resolved that all the knights of the island, and all the dames and damsels, should go meet them two leagues out. On the following day the knights therefore went out, and all the queens, with Queen Elisena and their company. What dresses they wore, and what riches, and how their palfreys were caparisoned, memories not equal to relate nor write but neither before nor since was there ever such a company of knights so highly born, and of such prowess, and of such princesses and fair damsels, assembled in the world. When King Lesuarte saw such a company, and coming towards him, he guessed who they were, and hastened to meet them, and he and King Perion and the Emperor embraced. Amadis was somewhat behind, talking with his brother Galaor, and when he came near the king he alighted, though the king called out to him to keep his seat, but he notwithstanding went up to him on foot, and kissed his hand perforce, and then went on to Queen Brisena, whose bridal child Esplandion was leading. The queen bent downward to embrace him, but he took her hands and kissed them. When Galaor, who was so weak that he could scarcely sit on horseback, came near, King Lisuarte went to embrace him, and they both wept, and the king held him thus for a while, and could not speak. Some said that this feeling was for joy at their meeting, but others thought it was for the remembrance of all that had passed, and for grief that they had not been together when their hearts so greatly desired it. You may assign it to which cause you please, but in either case it proceeded from the great love which they bore to one another." Oriana made towards the queen her mother, after Queen Elisena had saluted her, and when her mother saw the thing in the world that she loved best, she took her in her arms, and if the knights had not supported them, they would both have fallen. And Brisena kissed her eyes and her face, saying, O oh, my child, God in his mercy grant that your beauty which has brought upon us such trouble and such dangers may remedy all and bring about peace and happiness for evermore. But Oriana could only weep for joy, and made no answer. Queen Briolania and Sardamira now came up, and took her from her mother's arms, and they spake to the queen and all the other ladies afterward, with that curtsy which was due to one of the best and most honourable queens in the world. Leonoretta came to kiss her sister's hand, but Oriana embraced her and kissed her, and then all the other dames and damsels of the Prisena's court joyfully accosted Oriana, whom they loved better than themselves, for she was the noblest lady of her time, and the most affable, and for that reason was she so beloved by all who knew her. Thus is the meeting described, not as it was, for that would be impossible, but as is convenient for the order of the book. They now proceeded all together toward the island. When Queen Brisena saw so goodly a company of knights, and how they all looked to Amadis, he thinking himself the most honoured who was nearest him, she was astonished thereat, and though till now she had thought there was no household in the world equal to King Lisuarte's, she now thought that his court was in comparison like that of a poor count. She marvelled how a knight who had nothing but his arms and his horse could have attracted such state, and though he was the husband of her daughter, yet could she not help envying him, desiring that power and dignity for her husband, and afterward for Amadis 
by inheritance. Howbeit she concealed this feeling, and went with a cheerful countenance, though in her heart she was disturbed. Thus, as they went along, Oriana could not keep her eyes from Esplandian, and the queen, seeing this, said, Daughter, let this child lead you. Oriana then stopped, and the child came humbly to kiss her hand. She longed to kiss him, but was obliged to refrain now. Then Mabilia drew near him, and said, My friend, I must have a share of your embraces. At this he looked around with so sweet a countenance that it was marvellous to behold, and they went on with the child between them, talking to him, who answered them so well that they looked at each other, and Mabilia said, Was not this nice food for the lioness and her cubs? For God's sake, cried Oriana, do not remind me of that. His father, replied Mabilia, underwent no less a peril when he was in the sea, but God preserved him to be what you behold him, and in like manner has preserved the sun to excel him and all others in the world. At this Oriana smiled from her heart, and answered, True sister mine, you are tempting me to see which I would have the best. I will not tell you. Only God make them each without equal in his time, as till now they have been. When they reached the firm island, King Lisuarte and Brisena were lodged in Oriana's apartment, and King Perion and Elisena and Sardamira and Oriana, with all the brides that were to be, in the upper story of the tower. The tables were spread under the covered walks in the garden, and supplied with such abundance of food and wine and fruit that it was a wonder to behold the plenty. Don Quadragante took King Kildadan to his lodgings, and thus did all the other knights, each taking one of King Lisuarte's company, whom he loved best. Amadis took for his guests King Arban of North Wales, and Don Grumedan, and Don Guillan the Pensive. Norandel went with his great friend Don Galaor. But the joy which Agrayas had to see his uncle in Madasima cannot be related or imagined, for he loved and reverenced him like his own father, and he took Don Galvanus to his own lodging, and placed Madasima with Oriana and his sister. Child Esplandian had for his companion the king of Dacia, who was of his own age, and became his great friend. After the knights had rested themselves two days, they began to give order respecting the marriages, that they might return each to his own land. So, as they were talking together under the trees beside the fountain, of a sudden they heard a great uproar without the garden, and were told that the strangest and most dreadful thing was coming across the sea that had ever been seen. Immediately all the knights went to horse and rode down to the coast, and the queens and other ladies went up to the top of the tower, and they saw the blackest and most fearful smoke upon the sea that could be imagined. Presently the smoke began to clear away, and they saw in the middle of it a serpent much bigger than the biggest ship in the world. His wings were more than an arrow's flight asunder, and his tail curled up higher than a tower, and the head and the mouth and the teeth were so huge, and the eyes so terrible, that none could endure to look at them, and that black smoke which rose as high as heaven was the breath of his nostrils, and his snortings and hisses were so terrible that it seemed as if the sea would have burst asunder, and he spouted the water from his mouth so far and so fiercely that if any ship, how great soever, had come near it, it would have been sunk. The kings and the knights, brave as they were, looked at one another, and knew not what to say, nor what resistance they could possibly make. The great serpent, drawing nearer, flew round and round as if in mirth, and clapped his wings so loudly that the rustling of the scales was heard for half a league around. At that the horses all took fright, so that the knights, having no power to curb, were obliged to alight, and some said it behoved them to arm themselves. But while they were all thus amazed, they saw a boat let down from the side of the serpent, all covered with cloth of gold, and in it was a dame, having on each side of her a child richly clad, upon whose shoulders she was leaning, and two dwarves marvellously ill-favoured, and in this manner the boat came towards the land. 
Never trust me, quoth Lisuarte, if this be not Urganda the unknown. When the boat came near, they knew it was she, for she manifested herself to them in her own natural shape, in which she was seldom, for, for the most part, she assumed other appearances, seeming sometimes an old woman, at others like a girl. She landed and approached to kiss the king's hand, but he embraced her, and so also did the kings Perion and Kildadan. And then she turned to the emperor and said, Good sir, though you know me not, I know you, and shall be your friend, and you must remember me whenever you need my help, for though you may think my dwelling place is far from your country, it would be for me no labour to perform the whole journey in a day. Courteously did the emperor thank her, saying that he had gained more in gaining her good will than by great part of his dominions. She then looked at Amadis and said, I must not lose your embrace, noble knight, though now you will regard little what such as we can do. Good lady, quoth he, my will will always be to serve you for the great favours which I have received at your hands, but my power will always be weak to requite them. Then, having saluted her other friends, she proceeded to the garden gate, and there giving the two fair children into Esplandian's care, she went in, and was so well received as never other woman was in other place. She looked round, and seeing all that goodly company, exclaimed, O oh, my heart, see what thou wilt hereafter, thou wilt feel it like solitude, after having in one day seen the best knights in the world, and the fairest and most honourable queens and damsels that ever were born, and the truest love. So she besought leave of the queen that she might be Oriana's guest, and there she was honoured of them, as though she had been the lady of all. CHAPTER forty three. How Amadis gave his cousin Dragonis in marriage to the princess Estrelata, and made him king of the deep island. Dragonis, the cousin of Amadis, was not in the firm island when Amadis divided the conquests among the knights, and gave them those damsels in marriage, for he had gone from the monastery of Lubaina with a damsel to deliver her father, the which adventure he had happily accomplished, and being then near Morangaza he had gone thither, and was now returned to the firm island in company with Don Galvanus and Marasima. Now, because he was so good a knight, Amadis, who dearly loved him, took him aside, and told him that he had learned how the king of the profound island, who had fled from the battle of Lubaina, sorely wounded, was since dead, and that he would give him that island to be the king thereof, that the inheritance of his father might descend to his brother Palamir, and the princess Estraleta to be his wife. Willingly did Dragonis accept of this princess, and that island for a kingdom, though he had before determined to go with Don Bruneo and Quadragante, and assist in putting them in possession of their dominions. And he thanked Amadis, as so good an offer deserved, saying that he was ready to follow his advice, and at all times bound to his service. Amadis then asked of King Lisuarte the duchy of Bristol for Don Guillan the Pensive, and the duchess, whom he had loved so long, for his wife, the which the king readily granted in love to Amadis, and for the desert of that good knight. For this favour Amadis kissed the king's hand, and Don Guillan would have kissed his, but Amadis embraced him lovingly, like the man in the world who was more bountiful and gentle to his friends. CHAPTER Forty Four, HOW THE KINGS WERE PRESENT AT THE MARRIAGES the kings now determined that the marriages should be celebrated on the fourth day, and that the feasts should continue fifteen days, after which they would return home. When the day was arrived, all the bridegrooms assembled at the apartment of Amadis, being clad in such rich and costly apparel as beseemed such personages upon such an occasion. They mounted their palfreys, and rode with the kings and all their company to the garden, where they found the brides, all in rich array, and upon their palfreys also, and then with the queens and other ladies the whole company proceeded to the church, where the holy hermit Nasciano was ready to say mass. When the ceremony and marriage had been performed with all the solemnities which the holy church enjoins, Amadis went to King Lisuarte and said, Sir, 
I ask a boon of you, which you will be nothing loth to grant. The king replied, I grant it. Then, sir, be pleased to command Oriana, before it be dinner-time, to prove the arch of true lovers, and the forbidden chamber, for hitherto we have none of us been able to persuade her to the adventure, by reason of her great sadness. I have such confidence in her truth and beauty, that I doubt not but she will enter without let or hindrance, where no woman hath for a hundred years entered, for I saw Grimanesa's image, made with such cunning as she were alive, and her beauty is nothing equal to Oriana's. Our marriage feast shall then be held in the forbidden chamber. Son, replied the king, what you ask is easily done, but I fear lest it should disturb our feast. Affection will often delude the eyes, and this may have been the case with you and Oriana. Fear not, quoth Amadis, my heart is assured that it will be as I say. The king then sent to Oriana, who was with the queens and the other brides, and said to her, Daughter, your husband hath asked a boon of me, and it is only you who can perform it. I would have you, therefore, make good my promise. She knelt down, and kissed his hand, saying, Sir, I would to God that I could in any way serve you. Tell me what it is to be, and if I can do it, there shall be no delay. Then he raised her up, and kissed her cheek, and said, Before dinner you must prove the adventure of the arch of true lovers, and of the forbidden chamber, for this is what your husband hath asked. When they heard this, some there were who rejoiced that the attempt was to be made, and others who were fearful lest she should fail where so many had failed, and thus be put to shame. So they left the church, and made to the place beyond which none could pass who were not found worthy. When they reached this place, Melissia and Olinda said to their husbands that they also would prove the adventure. Thereat Don Bruneo and Agraes were greatly rejoiced to see with what courage they would put their truth to the proof, but yet fearing lest it might turn out otherwise, they replied that they were so well satisfied that the proof need not be made. Nay, said the brides, we will attempt it. If we were elsewhere it might well be excused but being at the place, it shall never be thought that we feared in our hearts this proof. Since it is so, replied the husbands, we cannot deny that we shall receive from it the greatest joy that can be. Then they told King Lisuarte that these also would prove the adventure. In God's name, quoth the king. They all alighted, and it was agreed that Melissia and Olinda should enter first. They then advanced, and one after the other passed under the arch without opposition, and went where the images of Apollidon and Grimanesa stood, and the figure which stood upon the arch sounded his trumpet sweetly, so that all who heard it were delighted, for except they who had before heard the same, they had never heard so sweet sounds. Oriana then came up to the line of the spell, and she looked round at Amadis, and her face coloured. Then she turned and advanced, and when she was under the arch, the image began his music, and from the mouth of his trumpet showered down flowers and roses in such abundance that they covered the ground, and the sound was far sweeter than what had before been uttered, delightful to all who heard it, so that they would willingly have remained listening so long as it should continue. But as soon as she had passed the arch, the sound ceased. She found Olinda and Melissia looking at their own names, which were now written in the jasper table. They, seeing her, joyfully went to her, and led her to behold the images. Oriana looked carefully at Grimanesa, and saw that none of those who were without could compare with her beauty, and she herself began to fear, and would willingly have declined the adventure of the forbidden chamber. In that of the art she had had no fear, knowing her own heart and true love. Willingly would they have tarried longer, if they who were without had not expected them. So, hand in hand, they went out, so well contented, and so proud of what they had achieved, that their beauty seemed to have been brightened by the success. Their three husbands, who had before proved the adventure, went through the arch to meet them, which none of the knights could have done, and the trumpet sounded again, and again showered more flowers, 
and they embraced their wives and kissed them, and thus they all came forth together. This done, they proceeded toward the forbidden chamber. Then Grasinda approached Amadis, and said, Sir, though my beauty may not be such as to gratify my heart's desire, yet I cannot for pride forbear this trial. It never shall be said that this was achieved, and that I had not proved it. That come what will, I will adventure. Amadis, whose only wish was that all might prove it before Oriana, that her glory might be the greater, replied, Lady, I can only attribute this resolution to the greatness of your heart, which wishes to achieve that wherein so many have failed. And he took her by the hand, and said, This fair lady will attempt the adventure, and so should you also, Olinda and Militia, for with such beauty as God has given you, ye ought without fear on so great an occasion at to adventure it. Perchance it may be accomplished by one of you, and then Oriana will be freed from the alarm which she feels. This he said, but in his heart he knew that none but Oriana could compare with Grimanesa's beauty. Grasinda then commended herself to God, and began her way. She reached the copper perron with little trouble, and went on, but when she was near the marble perron she was opposed. Howbeit, discovering more resolution than could have been expected from a woman, she held on, and reached the marble perron. But then she was seized without remorse by her goodly locks, and thrown out senseless. Don Quadragante took her, and though knew he there was no hurt in all this violence, yet he was greatly moved, for albeit he was now not a young man, yet did he as entirely love his lady as any of the other bridegrooms. The gentle Olinda came next, led by Agrayes, who had little hope that she would succeed, notwithstanding his great love, for he had seen the image of Grimanesa, howbeit he thought she could advance among the foremost. She reached the marble perron without let, but there the resistance began, and having only advanced one step farther, she also was cast out. Militia then came on with good cheer and a proud heart, and she passed both the perrons so that all thought she would have entered the chamber, and Oriana herself was dismayed. But when she had advanced one step beyond Olinda, she was thrown out, as if she had been dead, for they who advanced farthest were thrown out with most violence, as it had been done to the knights before Amadis achieved the adventure. The grief of Don Bruneo to see her in such plight moved many to compassion, but all they who knew that there was neither danger nor hurt laughed at his alarm. And now Amadis led on Ariana, in whom all beauty was centred. She advanced with gentle step and firm countenance to the line of the spell, and there she crossed herself, and commanded herself to God, and went on. She felt nothing till she had passed both the parents, but when she was within a step of the chamber, she felt hands that pushed her and dragged her back, and three times they forced her back to the marble perron. But she, with her fair hands, repelled them on both sides, and it seemed as if she were thrusting hands and arms from her, and thus by her perseverance and good heart, but above all by reason of her surpassing beauty, she came, though sorely wearied, to the door of the chamber, and laid hold on the doorpost, and then the hand and arm which had led in Amadis came out and took her hand, and above twenty voices sung these words sweetly. Welcome is the noble lady, who hath excelled the beauty of Grimanesa, the worthy companion of the knight who, because he surpasses Apolidon in valour, hath now the lordship of this island, which shall be held by his posterity for long ages. The hand then drew her in, and she was as joyful as though the whole world had been given her, not so much for the prize of beauty which had been won, and that she had thus proved herself the worthy maid of Amadis, having, like him, entered the forbidden chamber, and deprived all others of the hope of that glory. Isanjo then said that all the enchantments of the island were now at an end, and all might freely enter that chamber. They all went in, and beheld the most sumptuous chamber that could be devised, and they embraced Oriana with such joy as though they had not for a long while seen her. Then was the feast spread, 
and the marriage-bed of Amadis and Oriana made in that chamber which they had won. Praise be to God. The End End of Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Lobera Translated by Robert Southey